Jennifer's our keynote speaker. This is Jennifer Willett. She is the Canada Research Chair in Art, Science, and Ecology, professor in the School of Creative Arts at the University of Windsor, and director of Incubator Arts Lab. Jennifer, I think uh, I'm, I'm really glad that you're here with us this, today. I, I, you've been an inspiration for a lot of the people in this community, including uh, myself and the staff. Um, and I, I just, I, I'm really glad that you're here today of, of all days. So I'm gonna turn off my video and let you get started. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Dan. And thank you to the Biodesign Challenge. Um, it is a honor and a pleasure to be here. I really value the work that you do in our community and I'm absolutely thrilled to be part of it. And I agree that today is a difficult day to be here, but I think it's an important day to be here as we move forward and can reconsider biopolitics as part of our biotech future. So I really honor and respect your um, statement on Roe versus Wade. Thank you for having me. So my, given that, my name is Dr. Jennifer Willett. I'm the director of Incubator Art Lab. I'm a Canada Research Chair in Art Science and Ecology at the University of Windsor. And I'm here today to talk to you about my practice and how that might pertain to the Biodesign Challenge. Uh, so I'm an artist, but I'm also a researcher. I'm an in-between hybrid person. Uh, and I skirt a lot of boundaries and I find that really uh, useful and exciting in, as a research methodology, but it's also incredibly challenging moving through institutional spaces as someone who doesn't completely belong within any category. Uh, so today I wanna talk to you a little bit about what it's like to be an artist and a researcher and really a hands-on practitioner in the hard sciences, though certainly not a scientist. So to begin, I wanna say I, I work in a genre called bioart. Bioart is a little different than biodesign. Bioart is a contested term, much like biodesign. It's a new genre, or it's a new term to describe a genre that maybe has existed since the beginning of time. Uh, Bioart is a contested term. It's still, the, de the definition is still being argued out in conferences and in events and in publications today. It can include genetic art, transgenic art, biotech art, vivo arts, live art, life art, ecological art, land art, eco art, and by some definitions, performance and body art. But there's a lot of conflicting opinions on these definitions. Bio art can be understood as, an art, as a form of contemporary art production where the artistic media is living organisms. It can be understood as a form of contemporary art production that utilizes the tools of biological sciences. And it can also be understood as a contemporary art field that explores the parameters of life. And that would be the definition that I really am attracted to. And what that does is it allows things like performance art and ecological art to exist in the same space. But it also allows me to think into the very past. I think about early, early art forms. I think about uh, Neolithic paintings of handprints on stone walls. And I think about that type, those types of practices um, in the same trajectory as the practices that I engage with today. Bioart is not, these are also contested definitions. George Gessert would argue that bioart is not art that represents life, chromosomes, DNA, et cetera, is not bioart. Computer simulations of genetic processes, evolution, plant growth are simulations of life and not alive, that hence not bioart. Now that, that you know, artificial life people might argue that the environment is artificial, but that the life is real in those environments. So there's some conflict on that one. Uh, Jens Hauser would argue that um, bioart is not things like chimera sculptures or DNA portraits or chromosome paintings that are no more examples of bioart than maybe Claude Monet's paintings of impressionistic paintings would be considered water lily art or cathedral art. Some people are, think bioart is not artificial life, is not documentation of bioart. So photographs of bioart are not necessarily bioart. Body art, food art, ecological art, by some definitions are not bioart. But if there's one thing that I know for sure is that science is not bioart. And um, the methodologies and the, the types of knowledge produced between bioart and science, although sometimes look the same and the tools are the same and knowledge is very similar, the, the goals and the methodologies and the type of knowledge that is produced is not the same. From my perspective, bioart is also political. And I've always had this slide in my presentation, but I updated it today with the Roe versus Wade announcement. Because when we engage in biological artwork or biodesign, we are engaging in larger discussions of biopolitics and we are co-defining what our shared biotech future will look like. 
And so no matter how you position yourself and whether or not the content of your artwork or your design work is political, just participating in this discourse is. BioArt is also, from my perspective, involved in the production of meaning surrounded evolving biotechnologies, that the technologies themselves accrue meaning over time through like cultural interpretations. And BioArt is very good at creating strategies and structures and narratives by which a general public can understand and interpret biotechnologies. This is the work of Paul Venus, who is very interested in power uh, uh, relations within biotechnologies and creates artworks that articulate those challenges to us as viewers. Bioart intrinsically involves ethical considerations not afforded to other life forms. Now that's a little funny. That doesn't mean there isn't ethical considerations to other life forms. It means that they are more invisible in those artworks at times. So if you look at a painting, we're not thinking about where the cadmium was mined and who put that labor in and under what circumstances were they working. But those that those ethical considerations are there. But with bioart, those ethical considerations are brought to the forefront, that there is an engagement, an interspecies moment where those bioethical considerations are brought to our bodies and to our minds and to our eyes. From my perspective, bioart and biodesign are very different, but there are significant overlaps. And my work as a bioartist involves an enormous amount of biodesign. So let me explain a few of those instances to you. First of all, I spend a lot of time by designing new equipment and containment devices for safely exhibiting living bio artworks. And that means I'm worried about biosafety, but I'm also worried about aesthetics, like what story do those containment devices tell? What, um, what historical background do they come from? I spend a lot of time designing new type of architectural spaces. I'm particularly interested in certified laboratories that also function as creative maker spaces and as public art venues. How do we do that technically? How do we meet all the needs of the organisms and the humans in those space, but also create meaning or alternative uses or create hybrid multifunctional spaces? I'm involved in designing new bio artworks that convey meaning and have purpose and reimagine the limits of what can be made, which is very similar to biodesign. I'm interested, I apply uh, experience design principles to designing my art installations, community engagements, events, and workshops. And lastly, my lab, we are involved in redesigning how we practice biotechnological and bioengineering protocols to accommodate interspecies collaboration, reciprocity, and love within those methodologies. So I'll tell you, for those of you who haven't met me before or don't know anything about my lab, I'm from the University of Windsor. Windsor is a very interesting place. It's right on the border with the United States of America. It is a twin city with Detroit. This is a photograph from the end of my street. And so we are uh, in Canadian history that one of our prime ministers described us as a mouse sleeping next to an elephant. I'm crooked right into the armpit of the elephant. And what happens where you are affects me profoundly. I'm also living in the heart of the Great Lakes Basin. And so there is like a social political environment, but also an ecological pulls on me as an artist working within this space. I'm also on the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, which includes the Ojibwa, the Ottawa and the Potawatomi. And living in this environment, even though I'm on the border between Canada and the US, I am deep in the heartland of these other communities that also have important political boundaries and political intentions on my environment. Windsor, like Detroit, is the heart of the auto manufacturing sector in Canada. Um, and what that does is it creates a very interesting uh, student base of people I work with. My students have helped their parents take cars apart on their front lawn. There is a makerly culture here. There is a hands-on knowledge that has helped me grow my biowork practice to a really significant level. Uh, it also has suffered the economic downturn that that same region has in the United States. So uh, the University of Windsor recently purchased uh, the Armories building in downtown Windsor as part of a revitalization project attempting to transform our city. And they've built a contemporary art center with inside a historical building, the Armories building. And as part of that, I negotiated to have a bioart lab built behind a glass vitrine wall in the main atrium, the main lobby of the new building. So when you walk into my building, the first thing you see is an art gallery. And the second thing you see is a bioart lab. 
And this laboratory is intended to be welcoming. Um, it's like a transparent space. We, I teach in there, but I also conduct research in there. And it is also a performance space. It's a space where we do formal and informal performances or ex exhibitions of biological artworks that are not allowed to leave the lab. The space is currently being wired for theatrical lighting and sound. It will become a formal performing arts venue where we can do bioart opera, bioart performance nights, um, cabarets. I have a second space, and this is the Bio Incubator Art Lab studio, which is in downtown Windsor, and it's a storefront studio. I should say that the lab is a BSL level two environment. So it's highly regulated and it's really hard to get people in there who are under the age of 16 or who are not, do not have three days of biosafety training to enter that other space. So we created this studio and this studio is where we can make my artworks, but it is also where we can invite members of the general public to come do BSL level one bioart workshops with five minutes of health and safety training. So this space was allocated to me by the University of Windsor as part of my Canada research chair. And the research chair is focused on engaging audiences in hands-on biotech knowledge. Um, and you can see that I've created a really elaborate storefront to sort of call people into the space. And then within the space, we have this greenhouse that we're currently working on having certified as a BSL level one laboratory so that we can grow high school grade projects in this environment. We've already started doing workshops since things reopened, it's very exciting. So my lab and my organization and my art practice is rooted in this one notion. And that notion is that biotechnology is a technology of love. And um, this idea came to me after years of working in the lab, I had these reciprocal relationships with the organisms and I had highs and lows and I worried about them. And I could see that even working with me sometimes enforced, you know, um, it helped them grow and proliferate. And I tried to take good care of them and meet their needs, but I also sometimes killed them, sometimes on purpose and sometimes by accident. And so I really built a loving relationship there. But even more than that, I realized over the years that the human communities that I share my lab with could also be defined by a love relationship. And I don't mean romantic love and I don't mean Hollywood love. I mean a bell hooks kind of love where it's a durational political commitment to treat people with reciprocity and respect um, towards transforming the types of power dynamics within that space. So the primary objective of my Canada research chair in art, science, and ecology is to devise research creation methods, artworks, and texts and technologies that serve to engage audiences, species, and communities in collaboratively imagining bi possible biotech futures. The futures that I am interested in imagining are feminist, involve feminist and post-colonial perspectives, advanced digital and biotechnologies, historical, agricultural, and indigenous knowledges, interspecies collaboration, community engagement, sustainability, love, joy, and gratitude, and the acknowledgement of suffering and even death in the lab. This work I, I wanna show you stems from work that I was doing when I was a student during my undergraduate degree. I um, talked my way into, I convinced a professor to help me um, access the uh, human anatomy lab in the School of Medicine at the University of Calgary. And I spent several months going down once a week and drawing the cadavers. And there I learned a lot about anatomy, but I also learned a lot about the nature of death. And I also learned a lot about going somewhere where you don't belong, about, about um, medical practitioners, about doctors training, about the, the sort of like ideology that they're moving through as they're engaging into their own professional practices. And what I learned from that, that was the beginning. That was the moment where I clicked and I thought, this is what I want to do. So there's a few things I learned from this experience that I still hold true with me today. And I offer to all of you today as participants in the bio design challenge as things to consider as you're starting on your trajectory within the field. So in my experience, artistic education and research is not always understood or valued in the same way as scientific education and research in our society. Sometimes you will have to educate those from other disciplines about what you are doing and why it is important. Sometimes it is easier and more effective just not to tell everyone exactly what you're up to. Different disciplines have different community standards. Learn the language standards of the cross-disciplinary community you want to participate in. So for example, myself, I read a lot of scientific papers even though I'm not a scientist. I go to lab meetings of other groups and I sit quietly and listen and learn about how things are functioning in that space before I attempt to move through it. Uh, 
in my experience, institutions rely on a form of professionalism, including moderate dress, good communication skills, and effective paperwork skills. Now, I do not mean to tell anyone ever how to present themselves in public. Uh, I feel that we should all have the freedom to express ourselves as we wish. But as a young artist who was trying to talk her way into science labs, I found that when I stopped dyeing my hair blue, I gained more access to these privileged spaces. So in my experience, it improved my chances of moving smoothly through institutional spaces by adhering to these norms. Be respectful to people, communities, and institutions that differ from your own. You will learn a lot and make new friends and colleagues in unlikely places. It is often a good idea to go places where you think you don't belong because you'll find out that maybe you do. So now, 20, 25 years later, I run my own lab. This is the Incubator Art Lab research team. This is a couple different years. We do photo shoots every year. One had to be on Zoom, uh, last couple had to be on Zoom. And uh, so flash forward 20 years, I run my own lab and I hire, I, I only have paid employees, no volunteers. I hire artists, scientists, but I also hire philosophers. I hire nurses. I hire people from all different cultural and age range backgrounds to come and work in my lab. And together, uh, we are producing the world that we want to live in, but we are also producing amazing new innovations by having all of these people working together in the shared space. This is my class. I have an undergraduate class called BioArt, Contemporary Art and the Life Sciences. And it's I would say half of the students are art majors and the other half of the students come from all across campus. So they come from a variety of different disciplines. I get a lot of scientists who come in the class. And what happens is it's a very collaborative environment. And I sort of try run, test run different art projects and workshops in that environment. And then I get their feedback and knowledge. So they're really involved in certain ways in, in producing some of the research that comes out of the lab. We also have a lot of fun. In that class, we do um, really high tech biotech workshops, right? Like, so here's a good GMO bacteria workshop. Um, but we also do all sorts of like low tech, creative, fun things. So uh, in this slide, you can see them practicing sterile techniques, sometimes better than others, um, working with agars on a variety of substrates and tools, um, learning how to cultivate seeds in the lab, and then doing um, a pig embryo dissection in the lab. I have, we have an MFA program at the University of Windsor. We do not have a bioart program, but I would say about half the students who come into our MFA program are bio artists. So if anyone here is interested in doing an MFA on this topic, um, bioart or biodesign, please come talk to me. I'm always interested in that. Uh, we do a lot of events. I love to surprise people. I like to trick them into having a bioart moment. So I host these events like a parade or a cabaret. Uh, and then I give them a little twist at the end, something that they're not expecting. And the next thing they know, they're having a contemporary art moment, or they're engaging with a biotech organism, or they're learning about biotechnology. Uh, so this one is called Feasting the Lab. And this is when we opened my new lab. We had one night, we had a big cabaret party event, and like 500 people showed up. And we did all of the things in the lab that you're not allowed to do in a lab. And the next day we had the lab certified. So none of these things will ever happen again. We danced barefoot in the lab. We put makeup on in the lab. We did sangria shots in the lab. It was wonderful. And then we do that in collaboration with a variety of other people. So we had some artists come in. We worked with a local caterer who did amazing bioart food. And then um, on the bottom left here, you'll see that we had a choir come in and serenade the lab. I thought about what would you do, like how you might feast a new home or feast a new baby. We did all of those things to fet our new lab. I do a lot of curatorial work. Uh, this is an example of a curatorial project I did with students. This was at our five year anniversary. And this was a show at the Ontario Science Center, but I also curate larger international bioart exhibitions. And then I'm also, uh, in addition to all that stuff, the, all the apparatus, I'm also a bioartist, like a capital A fine arts artist who makes a lot of art work. And some of my practice looks very traditional and some of my practice really looks like science or biodesign or these types of things. So this is a, a recent exhibition called Baroque Biology, and it's intended as a feminist science fiction where biotechnology manifests as interspecies collaboration, reproduction, theater, and storytelling to reimagine our shared biotech future. And in here, you can see that I have large sculptural works that are um, biotech equipment that I've rebuilt from scratch, but there's also some photographic work in there. So this piece in particular is called the Great Lakes Algae Organ. 
and it's a Dutch street organ that plays live music. Um, but it also is a functioning algae farm. And I ride it around the Great Lakes region and take it to art exhibitions and fairs. And uh, people get to learn about algae and look under the microscope and do algae tasting. Um, but then we also engage with this as an aesthetic artwork and thinking through how a lab maybe doesn't have to look so clean and sterile. Uh, in that exhibition, I also had the series Baroque Biology Paper Theater. And that's a lab-based artwork where we use GMO bacteria to be micro performers within a paper theater environment. This project took two or three years to manifest. These are some of the first demonstrations I did in the lab to try and, you know, proof of concept. And then what I do is I work with my lab group very much the same way a scientist does. We have weekly meetings. We assign different duties based on everyone's skills. And everybody built up different areas of the project until we went into high, we solved all the problems and we went into production mode on this. So the first thing we did is we worked with amino labs kits to create a rainbow of um, bacteria using GMO technologies. We reverse engineered their recipe because they wouldn't sell us their agar uh, so that we could grow it in perpetuity. Then we started casting agar and learning how to work with it as a sculptural form. We started doing little vignettes and petri dishes of how GMO bacteria could interact with these other design or collage elements, but also maybe with the bacteria that comes in on paper collage. And once we came up with strategies we were pleased with, I arranged them in the, in the lab. And then we hired a photographer who came in and made a stat camera. And so these are photographs of the lab bench where I've arranged these collages. We photograph them and then we throw them into the bio waste. Like many artists, I've been working a lot virtually the last couple of years. So we've been hosting virtual performance and engagement events through both spaces. Um, I have a lot of alter egos, in particular the gentleman scientist character who often uh, works as a ringmaster, an ironic ringmaster in these events. We hosted a virtual opening for our new um, studio space where we ran up and down the street and introduced ourselves to all of our new neighbors and explained to them what bioart was. It was very befuddling. And then most recently I did um, a performance for the Global Community Bio Summit. And that was a, um, a performance live from the lab during the height of the pandemic. And so what I did is I negotiated with my Dean that they would allow me access to the building even though the university was entirely closed. And I crept in there in the middle of the night. It was like a zombie apocalypse movie. I was really scared about who would be in there. And I brought with me a couple of organisms because we had called, we killed all the organisms in our lab. I did bring some of the algae home with me and kept it in my you know, front office. Um, so I brought some organisms. I brought tomatoes from my garden and I brought some uh, zooplankton that I bought at a pet store. And I came in and I did this performance called gratitude offering to the organisms. And it was like a meditation on all of the other organisms that we share our labs with and the gratitude that we may have for them. And maybe also a meditation on reimagining our interspecies relationship with those organisms, as well as across um, other life forms, given that we're now engaged in this new pandemic relationship with the COVID-19. So it became a, a performance, a reutilization of this space to rethink our relationship to an organism or a parasite that we were trying to manage. So overall, um, I'm here as a bioartist, but who also engages extensively in biodesign um, to really reiterate methodologies of working through a notions of love as a way to perpetuate our relationships across species with one another and in defining what our biotech future could look like and who it belongs to. And so the last thing I'd like to just touch on today is that I recently published an article through the Biodesign Journal called Biotechnology is a Technology of Love. So if you have um, further questions or inquiry, you're more than welcome to check that out. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And thank you for having me, Dan.